Hi, everybody. I am going to do a series now that I should have done three, two years ago when my latest book, Wisdom in Bliss, is Bliss, was published in the middle of COVID. And um, my editor also recommended that I write on Substack, giving commentaries on the words of the book. As a way of publicizing and also sharing, because you, you know, no book can ever completely express what you really want to say. But this one is a trigger for what I really want to say nowadays. And so, yes, I have uh, shamelessly, I have a full disclosure, I do want to promote the book. I'm very, um, because it's not really, I'm not greedy for the money, I have a pension and I do give money away. I like to have it to give away, actually. That's the one thing I do like. But uh, I, am, I want people to be blissed out. I want people to have that cheerful bliss energy to bring to solving these terrible problems, to cast the right votes. Don't, don't elect any angry people. <laughs> That's been absolutely not a good idea. You have to elect people who have a vision of what can be done that's good, and they cheerfully present it. And, uh, you know, again, full disclosure, I think the current old guy is, is on that path. Uh, he's irritated me by not being angry enough here and there where I want him to be. But I think he's right not to. I think the one thing you can notice about all the ones who want to tear it all down is that all you hear from them is what's wrong with everything else. You never know what they're going to do. You know, they never say. Because they don't have anything in mind. <laughs> they just want power. You know? Anyway, so I want to do this. And uh, I have a sort of gap this afternoon. And my beloved engineer, Piotr, is here. Redlinski is here. And so I'm going to do the first thing. And of course, I look up, I look up on, on this, my book, on my e-book, on my phone. And I see the first word I wrote in the book, first phrase, four, syllable, four, four words. It needs commentary. I love the Buddha. <laughs> it's the first thing I wrote. I really like that. Actually, my friend, I have a friend who's a literary guy, really brilliant one. And he says he always looks in a book for the last word in a book. And then he gets a clue about the book from that. But he never said he looks at the first word. But here, I think that's a really nice book. I love the Buddha. I really do, then I say. And I will, and then the next third, the third sentence, I have a commentary on. But, but saying love the Buddha, okay, what does love mean? Well, you know, I don't want to go to bed with the Buddha. I don't. I love the Buddha means I want Buddha to be happy. Love means you want the beloved to be happy. Okay. Love doesn't mean I want to possess the beloved. I want the beloved to love me. It doesn't mean that. Uh, the real lover loves the beloved whether the beloved loves them back or not. They just, could, just can't believe that, uh, that this, any other being can be so great and so, so wonderful that they want them to be really happy because they're so amazing. You know, that's love. And compassion is the other side of that. Compassion is the same. It's not being able to tolerate another, that love, that beloved being suffering or any other being suffering. And so both love and compassion, in a way, are empathizing with the other. Love identifies with it. There's a selfish component in it, which is simply a bonus. But the selfish component isn't, isn't that I love the beloved and I want the beloved to do this and that for me. No. I love the beloved and... By loving the beloved, meaning wanting them to be happy, I imagine them as happy and I empathize with their happiness. Their happiness is my happiness. It's like when you have a child and you, you get the right present to the child and it's going, ah, I'm so happy. To have this. You really love that. And you're not, you're not the child yourself, so therefore you're not thinking about, I wish it had been something else, <laughs> which often happens when we get a present, right? Oh, well, yeah, they, thank goodness they gave me the tag with it so I can return it, you know, if it's expensive. So I love the Buddha means I want the Buddha to be happy. And what is a Buddha? Buddha is a being uh, who, whose life force, whose Im Im 
Not really, but the life force itself wants everybody to be happy, actually. Buddha, Buddha discovered that the deep, deepest, most powerful plane in reality is not exploding galaxies, supernova stars, crashed planets, you know, explosions in space, hydrogen bombs. You know, that's not the most powerful thing. The most powerful energy, which we refer to as a clear light, or better, better, uh, clear light. So it's light at its maximum speed that Einstein said it couldn't go beyond, which is around 186,000 miles per second. But the reason he says it couldn't go beyond is because theoretically, by whatever he thought light was, it would be everywhere if it went faster than that. So that, that's a high level of acceleration that would expand to infinity. And that is what enlightenment is. That's it. But enlightenment is that as a living consciousness, as a kind of inconceivably expanded awareness that identifies with all beings and things and feels one with all of them, which is like the great oneness experience. But it isn't the great oneness experience as if it was all just empty space. No, it's the great oneness experience of everything as they are, as it is, filling every, every space, everywhere, even, even what you think of as Differentiated space is filling space, that infinite space. And the wall and the door and the body and the plant and the tree, and that's all filling the space. So it's an infinite space that is full of all of those things and beings. So that is the most powerful. It's called transparency. And it's frustrating because it's invisible. Because, you know, you can't see it because your eyeball is, it, is made of it. So it also is your eyeball and your optic nerve and your brain and your thought and your speech. And it's, all of that is, is this same stuff. It's, this, it's, this, it's the one thing that is everything. But, but they are it without being destroyed into a space or something like that. You know, the experience that spiritual mystics have of things being destroyed into a space comes from, it, it happens in the moment of destroying thinking that the thing you're focused on is some object opposite from you and is a thing in itself, and which is the way you, um, you, put, you project into things out of being thinking that you are a thing in yourself. You are a you in yourself, all without interconnected with anything. You're an absolute you. You have an absolute identity, and you therefore you project it into everything else. And when you really focus on either your own self or on everything else, it will disappear under analysis, it will dissolve. And you'll have an experience as if everything is gone. Like, almost like a kind of death experience you will have, like suddenly, uh, almost like a nothingness experience. But it isn't nothingness because it's a vast, infinite awareness. So the awareness is, and the awareness in a way, when it's vast and infinite like that, it's so everywhere. And it sort, of project, it sort of extrapolates from having focused on a point and that point disappeared, that, there, that anything, everything has disappeared. It's sort of like, and then it's, and it is presenting itself as the last thing you can think of as a thing in itself. I don't have an answer for that. Is there something else? As a thing in itself, it's okay, it's all right. I will listen to your answer later, okay? So it, it, it presents itself and therefore people think a lot of mystics think that the ultimate reality is some sort of absolute space. But the transparency is not absolute space. Space is a good analogy for it. But it's all the things that are in the space, as well as the space. They are all, it's the transparency of everything. And there's no thing that's non-transparent that can sort of find the transparency of, as an object. But it, because it's a subject as well as the object. Do we get it? So it's a frustrating ultimate plane, but it's obvious one because otherwise, every time we were unconscious, we would dis we would never come back. Or if we had a mystic experience, we would just never we would disappear forever. And the Buddha, we even we can even experience disappeared states, infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness or nothing whatsoeverness, and beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. Buddha enumerated them as experientially as four, and he wanted to, in order to clearly warn us that none of those four are the ultimate thing. 
even though the one like nothingness is a darkness, the space one is a blank sort of whiteness, the consciousness one is like a kind of solar explosion, explosiveness. It's a very powerful brightness. And then there's a darkness. And then, then, then the beyond, the beyond is even more subtle than all of that. And it's very close to, very like transparency, but yet it's separate from all the differentiated things. And therefore, it's not the full transparency, if you follow me. And it's not a thing in itself. It's just a state of the kind of state that you go through when you're getting rid of trying to pinpoint something and hold on to it from an ego center. It's the last vestige of that. That's what it is. Do you get it? Is that, no, 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 you don't. Neither do I. But it does make a sense. It brings you to a brink that makes a sense. And from that, you need to concentrate and you will have an experience. Or you won't have it. It will have you in a happy way. As they say, I hope it's true. I think so. I think I've had hints. So, because Buddha represents to me where I will get when I can do everything I want to do for all the beings I love. And at that time, I will love everyone, even the horrible, bad, you know, Putin, Hitler, Mao, really awful, Genghis Khan, whatever, worse, the devils, all the devils. Lucifer, if you like, in the West. You know, Mara, I will love Mara. When I'm a Buddha. So that represents to me being able to be like that. It's kind of the ultimate happy ending of, for the universe, which is an infinite beginning. Because everything, nothing, nothing finally ends. But everything, it ends any suffering, any hor horrend horrible thing. But I am not promoting the religion of Buddhism, quote unquote, Buddhism, for anyone. I went all the way to India for a Buddhist global conference of the uh, Buddhist global summit for a, a Buddhist, um, global Buddhist congregation or some organization in India, where the Indians are trying to really be, embrace their ancient Buddhism instead of being fanatic only Hinduism. Of course, some Hindus think Buddhism is just is a kind of diversion of Hinduism, which is fine that they do. Who cares? But, but uh, and they have to expand this eventually. They will and they do and they have over hundreds of years, although the current, there's a current faction that doesn't want to. They accept Islam and Christianity and Judaism, which have lived since the time of Christianity, since the time before, before ancient Jewish, com Jewish communities in South India and Christian ones, since time of Christ, actually, and maybe before that time. You know, they were there, and they were tolerated and happy there, and they were not persecuted there. And Islam came later, and then Islam has its difficulties, but then Islam became very Indianized and very Sufiistic itself, and not fanatical, differentiating itself. So they said in the, that the conference, however, that they, the global, global summit conference was based on the idea that the isms, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, or it is, Islamism, Judaism, the isms are just there to divide people by dominating powers. They want to divide communities so they can control them, divide and conquer. It's actually not just a British Empire thing. It's an ancient Indian Arta Shastra thing, Indian geopolitics. It's there from the third century before the common era. Divide and conquer was put there. So I'm not promoting that religion. And so I went all the way to India to give a talk at that conference because I was thrilled that such a big organization was going, trying to go beyond the ism. Because I'm, follow, I'm a disciple of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who is the great gift being in the universe now, a days. I mean, there are, of course, infinite numbers of them, which he insists he's not the only one, but he's one of them. And he's a very visible one, and he's at his very, very venerable age. 
And he came up with an innovation within Buddhism, which is, he said, early on, before religions were involved in politics, actually, in the 20th, 20th century, that is, and uh, before the 90s, and he said, I give up the idea that you have to be a Buddhist to become enlightened. And that is what Buddhists traditionally thought, just like Christians think you have to be a Christian to be saved. Muslims, you have to worship Allah and be a Muslim to be saved, please Allah. Jews think you have to worship Yahweh. Uh, Hindus think you have to worship Krishna or Vishnu or whoever it is, Shiva. You know, the, the Chinese think you have to worship the Tao. They're amazingly different, the Chinese, in a wonderful way in that way, but they're also, also very Buddhist. And then they have a lot of Christians nowadays and Muslims. And uh, I don't know in Jewish Chinese, but I'm sure there are some. So we're not from, so anyway, he, and he said, so he, once he said that, what that means is, if you're going to seek enlightenment, and if you think you have a little view of it, then you need to find it in, in your own birth religion. You need to find it in others' birth religions, because you need to feel that all the spiritual great founders were enlightened. Moses, Jesus, many rabbis, many, many Sufi saints, many, you know, Muhammad himself, um, his, Ali, you know, his descendants, they were chosen, they were enlightened, they were touched by enlightening beings. They call it Gabriel and they call it Allah, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's, a, that's the force of light. That's what they're really discerning is the force of light. Then they say, well, that's a person, and that's a person who speaks my language, and they do that. I think the humans project that. I think the force of light is beyond human languages, but it's in all of them, too. So we have to do like that, all right? And when I, I listed on purpose in my preface, I love just as much Ms. Buddha, the Vajrayogini, to start with. That's the female Buddha. Her Holiness, the Shekinah, which is in the Abrahamic religions, that's the mother goddess, in my opinion. And I would make argument that is the case. The great mother, for those who have worshipped the great mother, the blessed Moses, holy Mary, sweet Jesus, Mary Magdalene also, brave, I didn't write her, but I should have, brave Khadija, who was the wife of Muhammad, first wife of Muhammad, who saved him when he was thinking he was going crazy, who also socially saved him before that, giving him a job and then marrying him. He was kind of an orphan, lost boy. The holy Muhammad, wise Lao Tzu, insightful Confucius. These are greatly spiritual people. They, were, they don't believe in a creator God in the same way, but they're really wonderful people. Radha and Krishna, Uma and Shiva, that's the real Uma Uma, not my Uma. <laughs> the who knows who she's an emanation of. White Buffalo Woman, Wakan Tanka, Quetzalcoatl, Chalchutlikui. That's a female Quetzalcoatl. Chalchutlikui. That's hard to pronounce Aztec stuff. Countless shamanic teachers of indigenous people and every single wise and loving grandmother on this earth. So many holy teachers, gods, and saints. They all perform such wonders and benefit so many, opening all kinds of amazing doors for all kinds of beautiful people, each to discover their own divine qualities, their wise intelligence, and their loving heart. So that's, that's the challenge. That's where we really, truly become ecumenical. And that doesn't prevent us from saying, yeah, but, you know, I can't practice all of these things necessarily. We, we don't have to all do like a Ramakrishna. He was a spiritual virtuoso, yogi, great yogi. So he was both a Hindu, Christian, and Muslim, which was the three ones around since Buddhism wasn't there. I'm sure he would have wanted to be a Buddhist if, he, if it had been present to him in Calcutta in that era. But the active ones were those three. And he went to being all of those three and it really did it. And we have a modern one who passed away now, the great Lex Hickson. He was a Buddhist. He was a Sufi. He was a Muslim. He was a Russian Orthodox Christian, as well as a Protestant Christian. And uh, 
I'm not sure if what other things he tried, but he did those three actually in his life. And uh, he was wonderful. And there are many that we don't, that I don't know, I'm not mentioning, but they're, they're, they're the ones that we have to emulate, I'm saying, to discover that wisdom is truly bliss. And the Gnostic Christians who were wrecked by Roman emperors who didn't like that idea, and many shamanistic people. I do mention my beloved Shakyamuni Buddha more often, since I meet him more and more as I learn, discovering how helpful he has been to me as a super scientist, a super educator, and a cool global social revolutionary. There I'm referring to where I think Buddha's, where I can do, we, you know, we, we've ban abandoned doing odious comparisons between religions. And, there, and this opens the door to learning from each other and appreciating the jewels and gems and deep insights and wisdoms of each one. And also enables us to stick with our birth religion in a respectful and honorable way and remain within that communion of grandma's religion, as Dalai Lama's ideal is. I failed in that. I didn't know my grandma very well. So we a nuclear family sort of thing. And um, I was never sort of into it. I don't know why. So I, I did not live up to it when I was younger, but I'm trying to now, okay? And uh, so that, but then given that, when we think of Shakyamuni, Buddha, as a, or, or Nagarjuna, or somebody like that, as a scientist, we can then challenge Einstein, we can challenge Heisenberg, we can challenge, although we'll find that many of them more or less challenge themselves, the ones who are anti, who, who don't become scientistic, who remain scientific, they're always challenging themselves. That's the methodology of science. They never settle on a dogma. But the scientific ones do, which is the dogma of materialism and that the mind doesn't exist and the spirit doesn't exist. And that they have to, they have to overcome that poor quality of philosophy. It's poor metaphysics. It might be good physics, but it's poor metaphysics. So I mentioned him, super scientist, I'm saying. Super educator, definitely. The path of how you become free of your prejudices, your confusions, your dogmatism, your fanatic, rigid ideas, and so forth. That he knows the best how to develop critical, critical intelligence, how to substitute artificial intelligence for artificial stupidity. <laughs> and a cool global social revolutionary. And the fact that he made social change is definitely the case. He was educated to be a general. Then he dropped out of being military, dropped out of violence, dropped out of the politics and ruling the kingdom that his, he inherited. He regretfully told his grandpa, his, I mean his dad, that he, he was going to become a different kind of king, a king of reality, a king of teaching, a king of liberating everybody in every country, not just a king of one country. Uh, dominating one country, but liberating everybody. And so therefore he was a cool, and by cool I mean he didn't just try to change the government as a revolutionary. He tried to change the whole society, the whole image, the whole culture. Cool, global, social revolutionary. Not so much as a spiritual person doing the great work of a religious prophet or a religion organizer. The great sociologist of religion, Max Weber, for example, he had a terrible time fitting Buddha into being the founder of a religion, which in his terminology was a prophet. Buddha actually was a bit of a prophet, but he, he wasn't in the same category as the other religious founders as a person, because he didn't say that there's a, I'm introducing you to God who will save you, which is what other religion founders were all doing. And he didn't consider the Confucians to be religious, so he didn't include them, Weber. He was just thinking of the theistic ones, because it's the early part of 20th century. So uh, I'm just saying here, I'm not going into Max Weber here, I'm just, because this is just a book for a regular person. I'll just say, not so much as a spiritual person doing the great work but so I'm saying it is great work, I'm not putting them down, of a religious prophet or a religious organizer. I follow His Holiness the Dalai Lama's sincere policy and prime directive 
not to missionize or convert anyone from or to any religion or secular belief system. And that is the case. You know, uh, that's how, why, but we did have to take the title Buddha out of the, out of the cover because when anybody sees Buddha, they think Buddhism, you know, sort of off the bat, you know. So therefore we took even the name Buddha off the cover. And uh, in fact, it is quite, because Buddha, Buddha's teaching does not say that you need a belief system, except one thing. The only thing you should believe in is causation, which means in a way relation. You should believe that everything is caused, which is sort of a scientific belief, isn't it? Um, there, I remember there was a famous speech was famous in the college I taught at Amherst College when I was a young professor. And uh, the president of the college, second president of the college during my tenure there, uh, used to give a speech about how causation was discovered in Greece, and that was the basis of science, and that's why we Westerners had the only science, because we believe in causation. And then I said, actually, Buddha discovered causation 300 years earlier. And he said, that's really fascinating. And then he continued to give the lecture that it all happened in Greece. So I kind of got a little discouraged in that college and moved to Columbia University. Although it's a great college for a basic thing, but it's got the problem of all American education, which is this book is trying to be part of a corrective against the problem. American education just gives our American culture as if it was the greatest thing that ever happened on the planet, and that is not correct. It is not the greatest thing. There are some great qualities about it that are as great as any other culture, especially the way we try to focus on liberty and equality. Liberté, égalité, fraternité, yeah, or, and sorority also, by the way. So, so yes, but it's not, we have really backward in spiritual sense, and we've become scientistic the religion of scientism, and we believe in nothingness, and we believe that we'll be nothing when we die, and we think that's modern, and that's really primitive. That's like a primitive people's belief, beyond primitive. Primitive people don't think there'll be nothing. So, I follow so sincere, Dalai Lama's sincere policy and prime directive not to missionize or convert anyone from or to any religion or secular belief system. In fact, it is quite natural to stick to that policy, natural for me now it feels, to stick to that policy, since the Buddha himself rebelled against the religions of his own time, which are different kinds of Hinduism, and there was Jainism and some other isms who weren't running around, although Jain is very close to Buddha, and rather set out to understand rationally and experientially, which means experimentally, with the same methodology of question all dogmas, the nature of reality, that's what Buddha wanted. He, he was going to do something realistic. He was not just going to build some pie in the sky that someone, that some unrealistic thing that somebody could believe in. It didn't make sense, actually. Blind faith belief, he didn't like that even. He said, that will cripple your mind, don't do it. You can have a reasonable belief. And you can have a reasonable belief in God if you want. But you might find some problem with that if you overdo the omnipotence part. We'll talk about that later. It's a nuanced thing, though. You can still get a lot of benefit about the God thing. The historical Buddha was a rigorous scientist in the modern sense, that is, an explorer of reality. I also unequivocally declare, and this is now my own prejudice, let's say, but it's where I've arrived rationally, at least. I think I can defend it in argument. I declare that he is the scientist who successfully, accurately, and comprehensively discovered the, quote, real reality, unquote, the real one. Not the superficial, illusory one, but the real one. The miracle, and I'm going to give a pen to it, even though it's inexpressible, the miracle of bliss, void, indivisible freedom. That can be the name of the transparency that I mentioned earlier. Yet for the sake of all the others, he did not ignore the less real realities. This is a preface. The man is really verbose. But I was also an educator, so I tried to learn and teach his curriculum, designed to enable any serious student of whatever faith or doubt 
to achieve reliable ha so lasting happiness. I want to say here, I only basically teach his curriculum in a non-academic setting. My whole 50 years, approximately, of teaching academically, I never taught his curriculum. I taught about his curriculum. I taught that, taught that it existed. I also taught the curriculum of Hinduism and J Jainism and Charvakaism and Taoism and uh, Shintoism and other Asian religions, especially. And I even had to comparatively teach something about Western religions in my job in religion departments, interactively, you know, comparing Buddhism and Christianity, the Eucharist and the Jew ritual, et cetera, you know, this kind of teaching I did, and even social science about religion, this sort of thing. I never flatly taught the curriculum how to become a Buddha, but I taught there is such a thing, is what I taught, always. So there was always that, and when people would come to me at the end of a lecture or something and say, oh, I want a guru, where can I find one? I would say, I don't recommend gurus. You know, I, a rule of thumb is you can study anything with any teacher as long as they don't try to possess you in some way and kind of own you in some way and say, now you're mine and you have to only study what I tell you and all this. That's no good. It's like if, if you came to religious studies department and we said, don't go study biology, you know, that would be ridiculous. So uh, that, I give a rule of thumb like that, but I never taught this curriculum. But nowadays I'm retired, so I do teach the curriculum. Teach it in Vajra Yoga. I teach it through this book. Designed to enable any serious student of whatever faith or doubt to achieve reliable, lasting happiness. I have spent five decades doing university teaching about Buddhism. Yeah, oh good, I said that actually. That, oh, what I want to say, I said that. Teaching about Buddhism, quote, Buddhism, unquote somewhat mischaracterized as a, quote, world religion, unquote. Since flat earth, modern Euro-American philosophy departments have not yet discovered the Pacific Ocean of world-class Buddhist and non-Buddhist critical philosophies. That is, you know, the, here I take up the banner of my uh, dear friend Jay Garfield, who, who is a professional philosopher and academic philosopher and challenges his colleagues in their Eurocentrism and provincialism that they only teach Western philosophy as philosophy and they pretend that Chinese or African or, Buddha or Indian or Persian or whatever it is is not philosophy because it isn't Greco, Roman, European, American. So, in this book I intend to teach the real thing a Buddha's threefold super education, which is divided into eight branches. And then last thing for this first talk, Buddha had to be an educator rather than a prophet or religion founder, since he had achieved his goal of an exact and complete understanding of reality, complete understanding and exact understanding by using reason and experiments to open his own mind and death transcending vision. He realized that since he, once a pampered yuppie prince, had been able to do it, other human beings could also do it. From his own experience, that has opened their mind, become fully open-minded, which is the definition of enlightenment. From his own experience, he could help them as a teacher by streamlining the process. He could not just, like a coach, you know, he could not just transplant his realization into their minds. There's some silly ideas, even in Buddhism, that the teacher can just kind of inject your mind with their, their, their wisdom, their enlightenment, but that's not possible. They could not get their, that would be invasive, actually, and intrusive. They could not get their own realizations just by believing whatever he said. He could only provide them with a prospect of full realization, a prospect of full realization along a path of learning and experiencing they could follow. They would have to travel on their own, but we should never be discouraged. Let's remember that he himself and all those who succeeded with his teachings over the millennia since then were originally just like you or me. Okay, so that's my first uh, salvo in beginning to make a commentary on my uh, wisdom is bliss, 
four friendly fun facts that can change your life, which is me now not just teaching about Buddhism, but teaching the curriculum of Buddhism and offering you this prospect, in fact. Okay? And I'm still in the preface, but that's enough for today. Thank you very much. That's number one. Okay? Dedicate the merit to you being a Buddha and me being a Buddha someday, some life, to be able to benefit everybody for the sake of benefiting every other being and to become a really good teacher to them and friend to them and help them all also become Buddha equal to us, not just so we can be somehow better than them, oh, but so they can, we can get to them become equal to us. That's the motive. Equally happy on their own, without us. Okay? All the best.